asked how we come up with confidence in information inside your confidence. Thanks. So I'm basically going to continue where I left off yesterday. Remember yesterday we talked about uh, how we can model operating parameters using categories. And today's, today we're going to talk about match between the algebras. We're going to be completely positive. Um, I remember I had two sort of themes. First of all, I wanted to link to more mathematical topics, not so much application, but links to other areas of math. Today as well. Today is going to be quantum information theory related subjects. And the other one is I'm, I am going to yesterday instantiated in different categories than open spaces and found the linear maps, specifically sets and relations. And we're going to see that we can actually draw apart some, some features of quantum mechanics depth. Yeah. So, yesterday we started with no copying, today we're going to end with no broadcasting, and specifically in sets and relations. This is what I just said, I think. This is supposed to be a picture of a private channel. So you can see the girl on the laptop. She's doing it very private. Um, right, so yesterday what we did, we talked about Fermini's algebra. This was the magic law that, that makes everything work. I hope we have a good interpretation for it, but it's important, so I'm going to go up there again. Um, we saw that in the category of local spaces, these things are precisely operator algebras, star algebras, and they're always of the form direct sum of matrix algebras. In other words, matrix algebras are very, very important things. And in the commutative case, you have one by one matrix algebras and it gives you bases. Um, but really, we're not really interested in the ma all the matrices themselves. Some of them are just sort of there to make the theory work. All that we can measure in, in Mars terms the work predicates of the effects and off terms of the observables are the, the self rejoined matrices. That's sort of all you can get at empirically. So we don't really we're not really interested in all the points of this matrix algebra, only the points where point A that are equal to their own adjoint. And remember adjoint in one of these matrix algebras, pair of pants algebras, looks like this. Okay. So you've taken taking the, the, the star in the star algebra the adjoint as a matrix means I compose with the involution of that algebra. And so really I'm only interested in those elements. Um, and actually I'm even interested in, in less things than that. We're going to talk about states, mm -hmm. so density matrices. And just to make sure they're all on the same page, I'm going to rerun sort of page you know, 1 to 10 or something of a quantum information textbook. So, when you talk about pure states, when you're very certain that your system is in this state and no state whatsoever with any probability is, is going to be in this state, then we're talking about a vector in the whole space, or if you want to talk about matrices, a projection onto that vector. So that's what a pure state is. But sometimes we're interested in uh, fixed states, where, where you know, it could be either in this state with probability a third, for example, or in that state with probability two thirds, and then we sort of sum the two up and we still get the state. There's an even, there's a better reason. So now I'm sort of pretending as if we don't really know in what state the system is. But there's a better reason why you would want to have mixed states. You start with the state on the compound system. I remember one of the key themes of this whole series of lectures is compound system should be taken seriously. So if you start with a state on a pure state on a compound system, then you partially trace out one of the two um, composite systems, constituent system, sorry then you're left with a state on the other one, and that might not be pure anymore, it might be mixed. So mixedness even comes about, you know, if you perfectly know well what state you started with on the, the bipartite system, and then just forget about the one. Uh, right, so instead of um, projection matrices, we end up with what's called positive semi-definite matrices. I'm going to have to have trace one. I'm going to completely forget about the trace property for this lecture. So I'm going to focus on positive semi-definite. And that's usually shortened to positive, and Basically, I'm putting up this slide because of uh, possible confusion that can arise because we've also seen that a matrix or a morphism F is sometimes called positive. Uh, you can write it in this form. say positive sort of in the 
concrete case. So when there's red things, it means we're concretely in Catholic no space or Catholic set simulations. And by positive, I mean positive semi-definite. Um, another way to say it is sort of this in matrix algebra. So an element is positive semi-definite is if it has uh, square root in this sense. So I'm going to say positive instead of positive semi-definite. And then we're going to extend this notion of positive to maps. Right? So just as we have linear maps between vector spaces are maps that preserve linear combinations, we're going to talk about positive maps as things that preserve positive combinations of like positivity. So a positive map between a matrix algebra and another one is one with by input and positive semi-definite matrix and outcome of positive semi-definite matrix. And this makes sense not just for matrix algebra, so not just for density matrices, but it makes sense for arbitrary star algebras, operator algebras. So also for direct sums of matrix algebras, if you like. Okay, so that's positivity. Um, but of course, we need to take compound systems into account here. So we care about positivity because it takes states to states. Right? So what now if we have a process <coughs> that lives over here, that takes states to states, and there's another system over here, let's say the environment we want, might want to care about. And we still want, if you start with the state of the composite system, then after you're done with your process of one of them, you still want to have a state on the composite system. So it's not just that F itself needs to be positive, it's that F tends it with, with um, so with the identity of any sort of ancillary system or environment system still needs to be positive. Right? If you have to have that property that's called completely positive, and if the map is completely positive, then you're assured that it takes density matrix states to states, basically. It takes bipartite positive states to bipartite positive states. Um, this is a large and well-studied class of processes. In a sense, sort of talking about open systems in the sense because this, this extra thing here, this extra ancilla or environment, this sort of the, the environment, the rest of the thing, we're only interested in this piece of the universe, but it's open in a sense that it does interact with the environment. So you could say that this is the right class of maps if you want to talk about dynamics of quantum systems. There is some philosophical debate about whether other maps are actually unphysical things and you should not do that. But I think it's fair to say this is by far the best class of dynamic maps people care about. It takes states to states. Um, we're going to see in a minute that you have you know, quantum systems, which are sort of Hertz algebras, non commutative algebras. You have classical systems, which are commutative algebras. You have all kinds of stuff in the middle. And there's lots of other reasons why completely positive maps are interesting. Specifically, if you look at um, post completely positive map from a classical algebra to a quantum one, so from a commutative to a non-commutative one, these are precisely the P of the M's. In the other direction, you get precisely the control preparations, if you like. But first, uh, yeah. these are automatically completely positive. If they're positive, they're not automatically That's true. So, so I didn't say that, but if you're between commutative algebras, we'll get there later. If one of the two algebras happens to be commutative and you have a positive map between them, then it's automatically completely positive. That's right. So, but I thought you were presenting this as an example of... Oh, <laughs> no. Uh, a good uh, example of why, why you want to use completely positive maps. And then no, so that this, this is the, the best reason, because it takes states to states. And then my point with this line was it, it gives you specific instances of it are, are nice to have, like the PMs. Yeah, but frankly, I don't understand what you're saying. It, it takes states to states because states are positive units of max, and and if you already you don't need a completely positive uh, map to take states to states. A positive map already does. So if I have a state of the universe, right? It's a big thing with an environment tensor to this side, and I'm interested in this system. Ah, I have okay. a state of the whole thing. Ah, okay. And then I need sort of yeah. that, this whole map is positive, right? Not just that that mm -hmm. one. Sense? Yeah, I, I now understand. Anyone else have questions? This is sort of crucial. Um, so, right, so that's a physical reason why completely positive maps are interesting. And actually, before they were interesting physically, they were interesting mathematically. You can see in the next slide. Because another way to say I tensor some environment to my system is to take a matrix algebra over your system. So, if I have some algebra of operators A, 
tensoring with and layer matrices with complex entries is the same as taking an algebra of n layer matrices, but now the entries are not complex numbers, but entries in that the, the given A. Right? And the way it goes is the basis for this space is that sort of simple tensors like that, A tensor a matrix with a single entry one somewhere and the other zero. And you send it to the block matrix we pass in that entry where the one was, you put the A in now. Um, and the point to make here is taking matrix algebras over a ring like this is a very, very crucial operation in operator algebra. You could even say it's the most important one. In fact, it's true that in arbitrary dimension, any sort of operator algebra you care about, let's say Easter algebras, all of them are of the form matrix algebras over some other one. So if you understand matrix algebras, you're in very good shape. Can you tell something about matrix algebra properties? Because it's a functor. Sorry? Yes, it's a functor. It's a functor, it's pointed, it's co-pointed. Uh, it's pointed by what is that? Uh, diagonal. Okay. Okay. So, isn't this less line distributivity between direct product and tensor product? Um, where's the direct product? So, okay, I sort of, in the finite dimensional case, this A is always a direct sum of matrix algebra, so that's what you mean. And that's true. But in the infinite dimensional case, you have to have hugely weird very, very nasty infinite operator algebras. So even for those, this still holds. And even for those, if you understand sort of the matrix ring over A, you basically know everything there is to know about A. So my point is just taking matrix rings is a very, very important construction. Um, right, so I promise you some history. This is the history of the Boston maps in a nutshell. It started with Lymark, who was thinking about the stochastic maps, rings, so positive maps between commutative algebras. Then that was extended by Steinspring to, to completely positive maps between arbitrary algebras, so not necessarily commutative ones. Um, and I guess the big break was a um, paper by Bill Arabson about subalgebras that we'll see on the next slide why it's important. And then in the 1970s, there were two sort of independent things. There was um, the Krauss here and the Choi, the Krauss theorem and the Choi theorem. And they independently realized that completely positive maps are the right, right ones you might want to use for quantum dynamics. And so Krauss came more from the sort of physical perspective, Choi was more from the mathy perspective. Um, right, so now there's a slide about. This, this middle paper by Bill Erickson, Erickson there, just as a sort of intermezzo. So, um, I'm going to talk about injective objects in the category. So if you imagine you have sets, x <coughs> to a, you have some function x from uh, f from x to a, and x is a subset of i, y, then I can always pick some fun function from y to a that restricts to the given one. You can just you know, choose on the points of y that are not in x, I can just send them anywhere, right? They will always restrict. I can just do this. Um, so, but this is not always the case. If you're in vector spaces, you already need actually the choice to do something like this. And if you're in something like the norm spaces that Mark was talking about, this is really a hand bandwidth style property. It's, it's not trivial. So in the general category, not all objects will be injected. And the injected ones are <laughs> not the same sense. <laughs> Um, so what Arvison realized is in the category of in the category of the objects are operator algebras, Easter algebras. The injective ones are the very, very nice ones, but you have to take injective with respect to this class of completely positive maps. And so injective with respect to the, to the normal star homomorphisms as they're sometimes taken is very complicated, but if you take completely positive maps, it becomes very nice. And then there's many, many characterizations of which objects are injective in this sense can be, um, it's precisely the hyperfinite ones, of which Bill Scott, I think, will be talking about over the weekend. Um, and there's some <coughs> other objectives I put down. So this is saying it has some very nice algebraic properties. This is saying it has some very nice compound tensor product properties. Mm -hmm. and this is saying it has some very nice properties if you look at it from a probabilistic point of view. All right, so if you take the work of completely positive maps, um, it's can easily find, well not easily, you can find out what the injective objects are and they turn out to be nice natural things. If you take more 
JavaScript to type the maps, then this becomes very difficult to see. Okay, but that's just sort of an intermezzo, so it's really statistics. Um, so what I'm going to do in the next few slides is, on the first two slides, we recalled what positive and completely positive meant. Now we're going to do this abstractly in a, in a symmetrical little category. So we have some of these algebra now. This one, not necessarily a matrix algebra, just some objects in the category with some multiplication. And again, I'm going to say that A is positive when, it's, when it has a square root. Right? When it has a square root B, that if I multiply it with its adjoint, it gives a given A. Uh, right? So if you work out what, what taking adjoint is, you compose it with this taking this evolution of the algebra. It looks like that. And then if I put on this funny bit on the whole thing, then you can rewrite this into that. And then I put C to be sort of this this bit, then that will look like this. Right? In the category of Hilbert spaces, so this always implies that. In the category of Hilbert spaces, this always implies that, so to where it would But this is a weaker property in general. So this is the general this, this is the definition we're going to take for when A is positive. Yeah, don't you have arrow going the wrong direction in the picture? Uh, where? So it should be uh, the base. left most arrow is kind of the same. So yeah, this one. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or no, sorry, so this one is up right here, it should be down. Hmm? No, no, the other side of the equal sign. Yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I'm picturing this right. No, 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 one more over. <coughs> oh, yeah, this one should be okay. down. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, as I mentioned, I'm very good at getting or two symmetries wrong. Alright, so this is our definition for when an element, well you can't really speak of element, but a map, uh, sort of a map of this type, oops, a map of this type is positive. Okay, now we're going to carry out maps. So we're going to start with uh, the definition in the concrete case of Hilbert space that we know. We're going to rewrite it and rewrite it until we have something that looks nice abstractly. We're going to take that as a definition then. Um, so we're going to start with the, the sort of Krauss Stein script, sorry, Krauss Choi theorem, which says a map between matrix algebra is completely positive if and only if, if, it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if and only if it is of the form um, sum of conjugation with some other maps. So in pictures that look like this, f is completely positive if it takes the matrix rho to this kind of thing, sum of conjugation with some other maps. I'm going to play the same trick, trick that Bob did yesterday. I'm going to get all these maps GI together into one big map by, first of all, indexing them over some base in I. Then I can get rid of the sum because I know that you know, this, this I, I in the middle is just, by definition, the cap. So it looks like this now. Um, and now I can get rid of the row. Um, so now we have a nice definition for when a map between pair of advanced algebras is completely positive, maybe when it's of this form. I didn't label the wires, but this wire in general can be different from those. This is the Ancilla system, as it's called. Right? It's not unique, it can be sort of, there's a sort of minimal one, but in general you can make it as wide as you like. And these maps, the sort of square roots, are typically called the cross maps, they're not unique as well. Again, there's a sort of minimal one, but it's only minimal up to U3. Uh, but that's just for maps between pair of pants algebras. So let's do it a bit more generally. And that's what Steinspring did, basically. So he replaced the pair of pants on the left. Let's turn it into an A now. Um, and you rewrite. So you have to insert something, some representation of that algebra over there now. And you rewrite the stuff that looks like this. And then, of course, you're going to, going to take the, the other pair of pants algebras away and turn it into an arbitrary dot. You end up with this condition. This is the definition I'm going to take. The map f between between arbitrary Frobenius algebras and arbitrary Cantor is completely positive if and only if it's of this form. So you went now this map is of this form. If you like, you can rewrite it once more, but that sort of breaks the symmetry on the right, so I prefer the previous one. But you can also say completely positive maps are precisely these things. Again, this is these are the Krauss maps, this is the inside the system. But this is the definition I'd like you to sort of mentally store for a five minutes or something. And completely positive maps are the ones that satisfy this. <coughs> we 
Because if you take this definition, then you can precisely prove a theorem fully in the abstract that tells you these are sort of the right ones, the ones that take states to states if you transfer with it some environment system, which is what we were after all along. Right? So in other words, the following are equivalent, the map is completely positive. If and only if it takes positive elements to positive elements when I tensor with some arbitrary environment, and it turns out to be enough to check that if the environment is a pair of pants algebra. It's an interesting type of that, categorics of quantum as well. Um, yes, that's not how it should be. Well, it's a good one. Your ease. Thanks. I'll try and fix them before I send them to the website. Um, okay, so now we sort of know what completely positive maps are in the abstract, and we know we have the right ones, in a sense. So, now we're going to do uh, uh, which you might think is a fun thing. So, we're going to start with a, cap, a dagger compact cap thing, so where you can flip stuff and we have cups and caps. We're going to make a new one out of it. So we're going to think of the original one as somehow having pure states and the maps that will preserve pure, pure states. And a new one is going to be mixed states and maps that preserve mixed states. So making positive maps. So the objects of my new thing are going to be <coughs> the algebras in the old one. Okay, so the thing we talked about yesterday. And the maps in the new category are going to be the completely positive maps between the algebras in the old one. So that's because you know, that's what I've been building up to. And by the way, I typically write these crowds maps as square root, but remember they're not unique. It's just a sort of Um, I have to tell you what composition and identities are because it has to be the category. Right? So um, you can have them inherited from the, the category you started with. So if I have T2 completely positive maps F and G, I'm claiming that their composition GF in the old category is again completely positive. So I have to check you know, this property that this is of the form, um, sort of a double form. Um, and the trick is you insert this thing, which is the identity in the middle, and then you can use that, you know, something about the bottom half, something about the top half, and the lead is of the double form. Okay, so the composition is as in the old category. Now uh, what else do I have to tell you? I want it to be a nodal category, so I have to tell you what the tensor product is in the new thing. And again, it's just as in the old category, and you have to check that if I tensor two completely positive maps in the old category together, the result is still completely positive. When you put them next to each other, you compute the and false stuff. And this comes out, and it's indeed the right form. I have to tell you what the dagger is. Again, the dagger just comes from downstairs, from the category we started with. If you have a map in the old category that was completely positive, so in other, sense, in other words, this condition holds, then if I put it upside down, it's still of a double form, where I just sort of pull this wire up a bit to make it of the right form. So all the, the structure is still as in the old category so far. The one funny bit is I have to tell you what the cups and caps are. So in other words, what the dual objects are. Right? And the dual object of, of some Frobenius algebra in the old category is going to be some Frobenius algebra on the dual object of the, of the sort of old object. Right? So you have to insert this swap and turn the arrows around if you like. I won't bore you with writing this thing out, but basically, if you um, have a look at, um, so you want the cup map here, you want this to be a completely positive map. Right? And this is the condition that says this one is completely positive. So this is the sort of funny bit you have to put on top, the thing on the bottom you have to, well, it's empty in this case because the domain is the tensor unit. So you use your spider here and it looks like that and it needs it up the top of one. Can you come back to Composition on and off again. This one? Yeah. So, how do you build square root of fg out of this? Oh, sorry, how do you build? Square root of fg out of square root of f. Oh, so I'm going to take square root of gf to be this. So, I have to sort of pull this wire up here. Mm -hmm. and, so the, and still, our system is going to be the tensor product of this one. Ah, okay, can okay, you move it? So, put a big box around here. Any other questions? Um, okay, now what we proved now is that this is indeed started with the dagger compact category and we built a new one. That's again dagger compact. And 
that if you have a look at if you start with the category of Hilbert spaces, if you do this construction, what you end up with is precisely the category of star algebras, as we saw yesterday, by convenience algebra to the star algebras. And the morphism now are completely false to maps in the concrete sense. So in a sense, this construction is precisely what you want. It works fully in the abstract. Um, so for the next 15 minutes or something, we'll be looking at a specific subcategories of this one, because some fragments of it are interesting. The objects are all possible operator algebras, but two of them are especially <coughs> right? First of all, the pair of advanced algebras, which are sort of completely quantum, if you like, and sort of the commutative ones, which are completely classical. Remember, you have stuff in the middle between the involved sense, the flimsy wires and the fat wires. You can have direct sums in the middle, but we're going to be looking at the two extremes. So it's completely classical and completely quantum ones. Um, and I guess for Shadow, Crash's talk tomorrow, I'm first going to have a look at this in the concrete case again. So in operator algebra, you also have this two extreme cases, commutative and non-commutative. Um, and as we saw before, the plan there is that the observables are your, your basic ingredient and states or something you reconstruct afterwards. Um, and so let's first look at the classical case. If you have some sort of state space, X, let's say it's a finite set or topological space, you can have a look at all the observables on it, so all functions or continuous functions from your state space into complex numbers. And so that tells you functions tell you if my system is in state a little x or a little x, then the speed of it, say, is 10. Um, you can make this into an operator algebra, because, of course, you can add these things, you can multiply these things point-wise, and multiplication is commutative. What do you call the operator? Sorry? Why, why the objective operator? Um, I'll tell you in a minute, because it will fit nicely into the rest. So this is a commutative operator algebra, and they're all of that form. This is basically what Kash will tell you in an hour long tomorrow. So I'll skip that then. And the other extreme case is if you have a pair of pants algebra, a so fully sort of non commutative thing, sort of matrix algebra if you like. So one like this. If you start with some Hilbert space, let's say C to the end, and you look at all I'm looking at a function from that space to itself. So let's say n by n matrices. And again, that's an operator algebra. Here it's really operators, right? Um, you can add them, you can multiply them, but matrix multiplication is not commutative. Okay, so this is a non-commutative operator algebra. Um, so if we get back to your question, um, if I have a matrix algebra, Sub-algebra of this one of all the matrices that sort of look are diagonal. And the diagonal here is elsewhere. And F is a function. <coughs> so in that sense you could think of them as a commutative. Um, so one of these first types of operator algebra as a sub-algebra of a non-commutative one, and that's why I'm calling them operators. In the sense, this is sort of the most natural way to think about it. <coughs> uh, right, so to get back to the non commutative algebras, the punchline there is that these are sort of all there is any operator algebra whatsoever, and that's into one of these forms. Specifically, the commutative one, it also embeds into the non commutative one. So then you can wonder is there something like, so for a commutative case, we have this with this sort of punchline? We have something like a state space, any commutative algebra operator algebra has something like a state space. Is there something like that in a non commutative case? That too. Um, so this is sort of a side remark. It might be interesting if you listen to the crash tomorrow. It turns out that that's not possible. Right, so we have uh, the real we have the commutative al algebras. It's a sub world of all the algebras. And we know. This is what I'm actually going to tell you, that we go up and down between state spaces. So I might wonder, is there something in the bottom right now that completes the square? It's a natural thing to ask. It turns out that if this 
the inclusion here is conservative, if you like, if this functor is continuous. And this functor over here, if there exists one, it must be it must degenerate. It must be very trivial in the sense that um, if I take a 3 by 3 matrix algebra, it will <coughs> get sent to the empty set. And so lots of operator algebras here will get sent to the same thing there. So it's a very trivial thing there. So it's a novel in that sense. I really need to do something else. But this is just a side remark again. So now let's do our story in the abstract. Uh, so remember, we started with some category C. We built a new category C P star out of it. We can restrict attention now to the sub <coughs> part of C P star of just the com sort of completely classical systems with commutative ones. Um, so if you write down the C P star condition, what it means for a map F to be completely positive. To rewrite it to this thing, where sort of, so you don't have sort of arrows in the wrong directions on the left anymore, and on the right you can replace this ancilla by actually, it's not just some some space, but a space with the chosen basis here. You can choose this one. You can, there is always a commutative operator algebra structure on the ancilla space. If you look at what this is in category node spaces, so now the objects are node spaces with the chosen basis, with the commutative algebra structure on them, um, and the maps are completely positive maps between those things. They're really just, if you write a linear map as a matrix in those spaces, then the entries will be positive real numbers. And so if you add this condition of trace one that I'm forgetting about, you really get stochastic matrices. So the, the transition probabilities that you go from some state in this space to some state in that space. And I think a lot of talks of the weekend will be on that topic. Uh, I think so far for completely classical systems. The other extreme case is completely quantum systems, these pairs of pants out first that we've been looking at a lot. Um, right, so let's restrict attention to those. Again, then the condition simplifies. Um, and this is really what got the whole thing started. This is the paper by Peter Salinger. And I think it's fair to say that's one of two seminal papers in this whole field. And the other one is the Ramsby Cook one that got the whole thing started. Um, and then the condition simplifies to this, because now you know, my dots are really a pair of hands, so there's no dots on the left hand side anymore. I can sort of rewrite them away. And the right hand side is still this sort of double form. Right, so if you're only interested in the completely quantum systems, you could just as well you can just as well think just about the objects, um, some objects in the old category, with the understanding that they have the pair of pants algebra on them, and the completely positive maps, sort of these ones, which are really the completely positive maps between the pair of pants algebras. Right, so it's a nice size description. Um, and you can also see that the pure world, if you like, sits within the mixed world as it should. In other words, there's embedding from the old category to this completely quantum part of the, of the mixed category. Namely, I just send an object to a pair of hands algebra on it, and I send a map to sort of the trivial way to double it, so without any, without any incentive, no communication whatsoever between the two maps. So everything is right in the world, perhaps as it should be. Pure sits with the mixed. Completely classical things are what we would expect. Completely quantum things are what we would expect. So in a sense, this is sort of the right construction. Um, just to reiterate this point, we're going to have a look at this condition we had on the previous slide for completely positive maps. <coughs> like in the concrete case. Right, so a map of this type, remember, is something from h star h to k star k, right? h, h, k, k. So in other words, if h is c to the m, so this is an m by m matrix algebra, that's an m by m matrix algebra. And by Choi Jamakovsky, that's sort of the way we built this, that corresponds to a map like that between a different type of space. So this is now c to the m, this is c to the n, 
So we're having a linear map from C to the MN to C to the MN. So in other words, an M by N, MN by MN matrix, which you can go up and down between, between these two things by sort of bending the legs around, if you like. That's what Joy Domogovsky does for you. Um, and this preserves a lot of properties that's going up and down. So the map on the left is self adjoint, for example, if and only if the map on the right preserves adjointness as far as daggers. So we sense that. Um, this map should have been in the middle. So the map on the right, if I input an adjoint of something, I might as well have inputted the thing and then taken the adjoint. Same thing for positivity, and that's really the point. The map on the left is completely positive, if and only if the map on the right is positive, in the sense that it preserves positive elements. So that's sort of the Troy theorem, or Spring Spring's theorem. Um, and to lead into the next slide, there's some other, I promised I wouldn't care about unital or preserving traces, but just to motivate the next slide. If the map on the left preserves one or preserves trace, that means the map on the right plays nice with partial traces. going to say something that you saw Bob do before as well. So we have this construction that you started with any of Capri, you built a new one out of it. So in a sense you don't have to leave the world of dagger compact Capri's if you care about mixed states and, and sort of open dynamics of quantum systems. But it's a bit unsatisfactory, right? Because you still have to carry all this information on both the base Capri and this extra structure and put on top of it by making it into a new one. So I might ask if you find a Capri lying on the corner of the street, when, it is a, when is it of the form CP star or something? It turns out you can do that. And the main idea there is we sort of complete the quantum algebras of, of this shape, these pair of Gauss algebras. And they always have a map to sort of discard the map, forgetting that, if you like, from the algebra to, to nothing, to the empty system, namely sort of capping things off. That's, you shouldn't think about that as a deleting map. So you can't have uniform no deleting in such a category. You really should think of it as a sort of partial trace. <coughs> that's what it is, literally. <coughs> um, so if you phrase that in the definition, it looks like this. Suppose we have um, some category of, of pure things, some category of mixed things, so pure sits within mixed. And in the mixed thing, everything has a discarding map. Charlie map has to satisfy some properties. First of all, it has to play nice with tensor products. So discarding a tensor product of two things is the same as discarding both of them sort of independently. Makes sense. Um, so this doubling thing is basically saying in, in the pure category, a doubling of a map, doubling of two maps are equal if and only if in the mixed category, tracing out one half of it is equal. So that's basically saying I want in the mixed category phases not to survive, I want this construction to kill phases, we don't care about global phases. And the third one is, um, as Bob was saying, by the Spavia guys, um, sort of purification axiom, saying anything in the mixed world that can purify to become something in the pure world where I just discarded the Encilla system that I used to purify with. <coughs> so anything mixed I can make pure if I want to. So all of, if you have all of this, it's called an environment structure. And then the theorem is, if you have an environment structure, then your category must always be of the form completely quantum systems and completely positive maps. Right? And vice versa. Of course, if you have a category of the form completely quantum system and completely positive maps, then it has an environment structure. My view this only holds for the completely quantum fragment. And that's an interesting open question to see if you find any category lying on the street, when is it of the form, you know, fully arbitrary algebras and completely positive maps. That's not clear. Um, I also promised you I would talk a few words about infinite dimension, so here we go. So I've been talking mostly about C to the N and N by N matrices. There's different ways you can generalize that to infinite dimension. Basically, you can close them in various norms. 
most general way you can do it is east around, where you close them in the uniform norm. So the most specific way that people often do is what Bart was talking about, close them in the weak star topology. And then it's called uh, Neumann algebra or W star algebra. Uh, and here's the Neumann in there in the scale time again. And one thing I think is not used very often, but deserves more attention, are things called AW star algebras. And they are nice because to link back to the professor's talk tomorrow, uh, uh, this morning, sorry, in the commutative case, the spectra of these things are precisely the Stonian spaces. So it's a very sort of natural class. <coughs> Whereas these ones are sort of the nasty types of spectra. And it's not a nice class of topological spaces. But for AW star algebra, the spectra are precisely the spaces that correspond to complete Boolean algebras. <coughs> Um, and I told you all of this because you can do a similar sort of construction not just on finite dimensional Hilbert spaces but in arbitrary dimensional Hilbert spaces. You just have to sort of rephrase stuff because in arbitrary dimensional Hilbert spaces, when it's not compact, you don't have caps and cups. So you can't say something like this. Like this, this thing is not a valid ingredient. Right? So what you do is you just unbend stuff and rephrase your definition like this. So instead of putting them this doubling sort of side by side, sort of, um, you know, put one on top like this. Um, but now composition, so this is a map from A to B. Now, composition is, if I have one of these and another one of these, I have to put the second one in the hole left open by the first. <coughs> so that's something you do. You start with non category you build a new one like this. And it's a well-defined category. If you start with, um, so all you need is a tensor plot and a dagger. You don't have caps and cups in general. If you start with one of those, you end up something with something that has a tensor product again. And if you start with something that did happen to have caps and cups, that was had dual objects, then this sort of infinite version of it is exactly the thing we had before. So completely the cell and construction, basically. But the advantage of this one is, that's why I was telling you about all these kinds of algebras. If you apply this construction to the category of arbitrary dimensional Hilbert spaces, you end up not just with finite dimensional star algebras and complete bottom maps between them, but with um, what's called type 1 factors, which are sort of nice classes of Neumann algebras and complete bottom maps between them that are moreover normal. Normal, it's very normal work, things that like this. Right, so there it still makes sense. And again, this this construction only sort of works for the completely quantum things, for the pairs of pants algebras. So again, there's an open question, how do you do this for arbitrary algebras? Um, some more words about infinite dimension. So a few words about what you can <coughs> algebras are nice. So we talked about matrix algebras and how they're important. Was asking, is this factorial? And indeed, that's the case. If you start with the C star algebra, the n by n matrices over it is again a C star algebra. If you start with W star algebra, and that's again n by n matrices. If you have W star, you can start with AW star, n by n matrices are again AW star, and all the three things are factorial. It's not, that's not trivial to prove. And the proof sort of relies on this theorem that. If you start with an AW star algebra, you look at n by n matrices over it, and then you take some commutative sub algebra. Right? So something that looks like, you might expect to look something like this. <coughs> because if your entries are literally complex numbers, you can always just diagonalize them simultaneously. It turns out the very same thing you can do even if the entries are in an arbitrary AW star algebra. And in fact, this goes both ways. Right? So I can diagonalize some commuting set of matrices, if and only if the entries are in an AW star algebra. Right, so another sort of hint that this is a very nice class of algebras. They make sort of obvious algebra work. And this injective property that I mentioned before, the sort of extension theorems, remember? Um, these are precisely the injective objects in the category of C star algebras. Right, and this is the theorem due to Gleason. The Gleason and Gleason theorem, but this is not this theorem. 
So they're not stock sales worse. Right, and the point I wanted to make with this slide is so now we have one big category where we don't just have the, the single flimsy lines and the fat lines, we have sort of flimsy lines sitting within the fat lines. So they all live in the same on an equal footing, if you like. So I can start to investigate you know, the, the interrelations between the two, between classical and quantum and fast terms or hybrids. Um, so one thing, the kind of interaction that you might care about is the quantum teleportation that we've heard a few times by now. So if you work out what that does, you can do it fully generally now. So we have this, what Bob was calling this, this telephone wire from, so Alice is the left half, Bob is the right half, here's Alice's thing she does, there's Bob's direction does, there's actually this telephone wire here now. Um, so all you need is two, two Frobenius algebras of the same carrier object that are complementary in the sense that Alex mentioned. Um, then you can do this whole nasty looking thing. And it turns out if you calculate them all out using the complementarity rule and the spider theorem, that does what it should do. Right? And all these things are actual nice unitaries, so you can physically do them. So the point I'm trying to make is this works for arbitrary for being disastrous, right? not necessarily commutative ones. So they can be arbitrary faster things of mixtures, direct sums of matrix algebras, if you like. So I'm not really sure what that means, because you can't really think of this bit as classical communication then, right? They're not bits, <coughs> but they might be you know, some, some faster bits. But still, the correctness of the protocol works. But we'll just not fail what the protocol does. Okay. And for the final ten minutes, I'm going to talk about the third theme that as well yesterday, you can do the whole story not in sets, not not in the spaces and bounded linear maps, but in this sort of possibilistic world of sets and relations. So if you remember, objects and sets, morphisms are relations. You put things side by side by a Cartesian product, and the operator algebras are group points in this world. All right. So the first question is, what's a completely positive map now? Um, so here is, so let's calculate. I remember, the nice thing about this sets and relation world is that instead of, in addition to the diagram, you can actually sort of input little arrows on it as if they are flowing through the diagram because there's nothing like cancellation in the middle. You can scale those as 0 and 1. So a relation is of this double form. You can calculate what that means. Precisely if um, you know, some pair leads to another pair, and so that you can swap um, left and right half of the output. And if it holds for this pair, then it also holds for sort of the double pair uh, with both left halves and right halves, if you like. Right, so easy computation you can and use this output, but I don't have time for now. And the other ingredient we needed to check whether something is completely positive is what this funny thing was that we had to put on top and above all our maps. Now remember, this is actually the multiplication of the group point. So um, G1, G2 will be connected to G, if and only if you know, G1 times G is actually G2. Right? But because we're in a group point, I can put, I can use my inverse and put G1 on the other side. Right? So it's like this. So right? the only thing that G1 and G2 can possibly connect to is this G inverse. So that's what that map looks like. So if you put it together now, remember, <coughs> and that R is completely positive if this thing um, is of the double form. So this thing we know now is precisely the relation that relates uh, G1 inverse G2 to H1 inverse H2. Or R would be G1, G2, H1, H2. <coughs> and if you remember, that thing is of the double form precisely when this implies that you can swap the two sort of left and right bits of it, and you can double the left bits if you like. Right, so, completely positive if and only if this implies that. And you can choose your G1, G2 wisely, you can simplify a lot. So, completely positive precisely means this property. If G is related to H, then the inverses are related and the 
identity maps and domains are related. So you can call a map like that respecting inverses if you like. It's a sort of a funny thing. Because usually you would think about the map between group points as you know, some function that preserves composition and has inverses and all that. So here's something that just respects the inverses but says nothing whatsoever about, about composing. Right, so what we've calculated is that if you start with sets and relations, this possibilistic quantum mechanic, you do this construction that sort of adds mixedness, you end up with the category of group voice and these funny relations that respect the inverses. Um, right, so let's compute what are the completely classical objects, what are the completely quantum objects. So what's a pair of fan cells for every other? So remember the carrier set is now some set A times A. So when is a pair of things, a pair of pairs related to something else? So in other words, when is this sort of flow diagram connects to something else? Oh, precisely when these two are equal, and then it will connect to the pair P2, A1, right? And if they're not equal, then there's no point in the middle through which they can connect, if you like. Um, and it follows from this that the identity arrows are precisely the things which form A comma A. And from that it follows that you know, every object has a unique identity arrow to it, so the objects of the group weight must be in correspondence with the set A. And it also follows that if you have a look at what the domain and codomain of these pairs of arrows are, is that um, this pair is the unique arrow from A1 to A2. So rephrase. In one of these completely quantum group points, if you like, there's a unique arrow from any object to any other object. This is very boring, sometimes called indiscreet. So there's no interesting information. Everything is given in the objects already. Um, right, let's talk a bit about subsystems, like, like in this sense. Right? I'm sometimes interested in what subsystems are. For example, if you start with um, classical structure, the spiders that Bob and Alex were using. And you can get the basis out of them by looking at what which states are copied. So which states satisfy this. Right, so now if I have the group point here, and state, which is just a subset of the set of arrows of the group points, so does it satisfy this? <coughs> and I'm slightly pressed for time, so I'm not going to bore you with a little proof. You can have a look at the slides. But it turns out they're precisely the sort of connect components of a group point. So <coughs> That I mean, the group point you can think about as a bunch of objects. For example, in this 15-16 puzzle, there would be 16 objects uh, with lots of maps between them. I could sort of move this over there, and this over there, etc. And lots of other things. Uh, so, identity maps. So, by connected components, I mean something like this, where there's no arrows out. So that's a sort of, if you think about the group point in a sort of graph theoretic sense like this, that's a natural thing to do. So copyable states in the world of possibilistic quantum mechanics, in the fully general quantum case, correspond to something natural, namely connected components of a group point. Another thing we didn't really talk about yet is um, projections. If you start analyzing operating problems, Projections just means that p squared equals p and also equals p diagonal. So we can check what these things are. Um, and it sort of immediately follows that this left equation tells you that p is a subset of arrows and it has to be closed on the multiplication. Right? And the second equation tells you it has to be closed on the inverse. In other words, the subset must form a subgroup. Projections, which are natural in the, in the operator algebra sense, are also something natural in the group point sense, in the possibilistic sense. With those subgroup points. Um, and now I can start making some differences, noting some differences between you know, quantum mechanics in the sense of over spaces and quantum possibilistic quantum mechanics in the sense of, in the sense of sets and relations. Really sometimes people think that the, the classical things are precisely the commutative things. And other people think that 
classical objects are precisely those whose projection lattice is distributed, in the sense that uh, this law holds. And both implications do not hold in this possibilistic world. There's two counterexamples. There's, there's a commutative group, even, right? Not just a group point, but not even a group point, but a group. Um, its lattice of subgroup points is this one. <coughs> it's sort of a trivial subgroup point. There's three copies of Z2 embedded in different ways. Um, this is not an distributive lattice. You can check it. Take this to be A, a this to be B, this to be C, and this thing will fit in. Right. But in the other direction, here's another counterexample. So, by this, I mean the group point. Or the graph says I have two objects. subgroup points, this is the lattice, it's a distributed lattice, right? But this group point is not commutative, right? If I compose F and F inverse, I get something else, and if I compose it in the other way. And so both of these things fit. Right? So in the, by moving to a possibilistic world, if you like, you can see that some things that people typically think about as classical properties um, might not be as classical as you think. this. And finally, I'm going to talk about you know, podcasting. So yesterday we started with you know, copying, remember? Um, and the point about that was, we know you cannot copy an unknown state. It doesn't exist in a quantum copying machine. Um, and classical mechanics has, you can copy classical mechanics, and you cannot copy in quantum mechanics. But it doesn't really set quantum mechanics apart yet, because you can also copy, and you cannot copy in statistical sort of a mixed version of classical, if you like. Uh, the point is that this copying is about pure states. If you go to a mixed version, that's called broadcasting. Sorry. So I'm going to call an object broadcastable, an object broadcastable. If there exists some broadcasting map, right, which has to be completely positive, such that I give it something to the broadcaster. When it's done broadcasting, I forget about one of the two. I can't really call them copies, but uh, broadcasts, I guess. Um, then what you're left with is, is really the thing you started with. So this is called a broadcasting map. <coughs> Commutative algebras are always broadcastable, because you can just take the full multiplication to be a broadcasting map, and almost by definition, the property of all holes. Um, and then there's a nice theorem by you know, lots of people, including John Barrett, who's up next, that in the category of those spaces, if a pair of fans algebra is broadcastable, there must be a trivial pair of fans. There must be sort of the complex numbers. In other words, the only thing you can broadcast are this classical information, this direct sums of, of one-dimensional algebras. But if you now have a look at what this means in sets of relations, Broadcastable turns out to mean totally disconnected, and again I'll skip the little proof, um, in the sense that there are only maps from an object to itself. So no object between, no morphism between different objects. But of course that's a very different property than being commutative. So there's totally disconnected group points that are not commutative, and there are um, and the other way. Right, so again, by moving to a possibilistic world, you can sort of tell things that people typically think about as quantum or classical are not really as quantum or classical as you might have thought. That's one of the points. Uh, okay, so to summarize, what have we learned? We learned that Frobenius' law is a very powerful thing. It, it happens to capture sort of both classical and quantum information on the same footing. We can do it in an arbitrary natural maps between Trevenian algebra are completely positive maps. It matches with the mathematics, it matches with the physics, and it works in a completely general mode of category again. Um, so now you have them on an equal footing, you can sort of start to study their interaction, and one way you could do it is, for example, the teleportation protocol that uses both classical and quantum, or even faster hybrids of the two. 
Um, and in the two examples we looked at, these are very natural things. In the operator algebras and groupoids. And in the non-standard models, these groupoids give counter-examples to show that various properties are not as clear-cut as you might have thought. 